We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. The internet has started to perceptibly shift from its inherent open origins to an entity restricted by sovereign, nationalistic, and exclusionary concerns. In this age of digital sovereignty, where do policy fault lines lie between its various stakeholders when it comes to finding an equitable balance between the expression, security, enablement, and privacy imperatives of the internet? This roundtable seeks to answer this very question by bringing forth a plurality of perspectives supported by evidence of both present predicaments and emerging literature to the enterprise of internet governance. We will do this first by diving into the philosophical and historical context of the need for constitutionalizing the internet. By journeying through the terrain of the many, many conundrums and emerging dilemmas in the space, we will then proceed into a discussion about the best practices and lessons of note. Through our analysis, we hope to carve out space for a prolonged dialogue about a rights-based policy charter for the internet. And in this session, we begin to think about the direction this can take. Before we kick start the discussion, we'd like to introduce ourselves and our body of work. We at the Institute for the Internet and the Just Society are a youth-driven think and do tank composed of students, lawyers, policy practitioners, academics, and digital rights activists across the globe. Within the Institute, we are a part of the research program on digital constitutionalism, where we map the varied approaches to governance of the digital ecosystem. We do this through our flagship projects, Aristotle and the Digital Policy Tracker. Our objective at this program is to plot developments of pertinence to global and local regulatory frameworks along a continuum. At the tracker, we critically analyze policy escalations from around the world to better understand the dynamic nature of our ecosystem. At Aristotle, we concretize our understanding of the present and the past by theorizing about our collective digital futures. Today, I, Sanskriti, along with my colleague from the program, Siddhant, will be your moderators. Our panelists for today, Sonia, Nicola, Raghu, Hiba, Saishra, and Harshvi are members of the program. We thank you for tuning into our roundtable, which in many ways is a collection of the insights garnered by us through our projects and the conversations the journey of implementing them has entailed. In the first set of questions that we ask, our endeavor will be to think about how we can constitutionalize the internet creatively, collectively, and collaboratively, a task which requires us to think alongside Lawrence Lessig and ask difficult questions about how the code functions as law at this new site of governance. With that, our very first question is for Sonia. How must the norms, values, concepts, and theories at the heart of constitutional discourse be reimagined if the internet is to be conceptualized and regulated as a democratic domain? First of all, well, um, welcome everybody. And thank you so much, Sid, for this question. I think it truly encapsulates one of the core challenges of the internet governance. To answer it, we need to take a step back and look at the main characteristics that define the, the constitutional discourse. Generally, when we think about the constitution, we think about the texts that define the governance of a given country. From this perspective, the state through the constitution obtains the power to enforce laws as well as the role to embody the values shared by its people. Yet the creation of a constitution also implies that a shift in the organization of society itself. There is a need for a change in governance that is linked to the necessity to rethink the social contract that ties the community together. For this reason, the constitutionalism discourse often goes, often goes hand in hand with the democratic one. As people, we come together to decide what is the fair way to regulate and govern ourselves. As we're here today uh, at the Internet Governance Forum, it's obvious that cyberspace is going through a similar constitutional moment. We are all here united to discuss and present different points of view of how to better regulate the online world since our lives have moved more and more in the digital space. 
to our work on the digital policy tracker, uh, we're, also witnesses, we're also witnessing this growing trend. Um, as you know, across continents, government, civil society, and other non-state actors are raising more and more questions on how we should better regulate the internet and digital technologies in general. The advent of the internet constitutes a major technological development for society. Its ability to scale at an unprecedented pace has led to an important change in our society. We are now able to communicate with people all over the world uh, simultaneously. I think this is uh, an example of how this is happening, actually. <laughs> this shift forces us to question what the new values and norms at the base of our social contract are, which voices should be leading the conversation, and which one should be embodying a global community of internet users. The constitutional moment of cyberspace is key to setting the standard for a democratic and balanced governance of our digital future lives. However, when we're trying to rethink the constitutional discourse within the context of the internet, it is important to keep in mind that the traditional discourse on constitutionalism uh, can be at odds with the one in the digital space. The key feature that made the internet a cause for social change are also the main challenges of its governance. From the transnational nature of the internet to the scalability of digital technology, who are constantly questioning the traditional governance of the state. Because of this vacuum of power, other non-state actors have managed to take more and more space in this sphere. The competition in powers is quite obvious, I would say, uh, if we look at the internet as it is today. Private companies such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, and other big tech companies really hold an important role in the governance of the internet as their decision can go beyond the regulatory measures of the jurisdiction in which they operate. So, when looking at how we should rethink the constitutional discourse to ensure that the internet is to be conceptualized and regulated as a democratic domain, there is a need for a creative solution that goes beyond the traditional forms of governance. So the main question is, how do we do that? Uh, to begin, I believe that it's important to conceptualize a decentralized governance that allow us to democratize cyberspace in, a ways, that go, in ways that go beyond national borders. One concept of how this could be achieved is called collective intelligence, as theorized by Jeff Morgan. Uh, as you can imagine, this concept stems from the idea that collectively, we can work more intelligently. It implies that to better govern the internet, we need to have a global discussion on how to go forward and look at how different jurisdictions approach tech regulations. This is very much the endeavor of our digital constitutional um, uh, digital constitutionalism uh, research program, as well, I guess, the uh, goal of the IGF today. So the concept of collective intelligence uh, is not completely new in this field, of course. The open source community has been promoting this approach since the 90s. And while it has been mostly developed through coding and applied mostly in the tech community, it shows how collectively we can contribute to solving problems and building better tools that make our life better in the long run. So this implies, of course, bringing stakeholders that will normally be ignored from the traditional govern government space uh, in these discussions. So, an example of this could be including sex workers and activists and youth-led organization to content moderation panels, to conferences, and really shape uh, policy making in this sphere. And it's also important to conclude that to make sure that this process of democratization of the internet remains balanced, we continue to ask and have conversation on what is fair and what is not. The discussion on what is the best democratic governance has been going on since the ancient Greece. And as history has proved multiple times, there is a need to continue uh, to ask this question if we want to get closer to our idea of fair and just society. So I hope this replies to your answer and Sid, uh, it's back to you. Thank you, Sonia, for sharing your ideas with us and for ensuring that this round table is off to such a brilliant start. Um, the constitutional moment that you speak of is incomplete without a reference to the dynamism of the constitutional and digital ecosystems, not to mention to that of their imbrication in this field that we're beginning to know as digital constitutionalism. As Eduardo Celeste highlights, as do you, through the various pivotal questions you raise and address throughout your response, since the challenges of the digital age are different from those we have faced in the past,
The constitutional settings for life in this age must also necessarily be adapted and modified to reflect the dawn of the new constitutional moment. And perhaps that is where we need to more seriously consider the idea of collective intelligence that you speak of as a bridge between the old and the new. Um, what I find equally interesting is the note you end on. Uh, if the continuation of conversation seeks of us answers to the questions of what is fair, what is a must, uh, what is a just, then so on, uh, we must be prepared to evolve and accord credence to a diversity of voices. But, and this is the idea we would request Nicola to offer his thoughts on, such statements are hollow unless we have a better understanding of who holds a stake in this ecosystem. The statement you, Sonia, conclude your response on animates this as well, when it thinks of a just society, which if we think of as a community of people requires us to account for who the term includes within its remit. So a question to you, Nicola, is, if the internet is to be thought as of the people, by the people, and for the people, is it necessary for us to question who the term people encompasses? Who then can we identify as stakeholders in a global digital ecosystem and what role must each of them perform? Well, when the first coined by Lincoln, well, of the people, by the people and for the people meant something quite clear and quite precise. The citizens of the 34 American states at the time and more precisely those in capacity of exercising their political rights which uh, really meant only white ales of voting age and no criminal record. Only they had the right to vote and whether directly or indirectly have a say on the policies governing their daily life, whether on trade, health or education. Applying such a principle to the internet implies a widely different and far more complex, really, setting. The usual when institutional paradigms of democratic participation do not apply to the World Wide Web. And the starting point of this discrepancy is quite clearly the inapplicability or rather the incomplete applicability of our Westphalian principles to the dynamics of the internet of today. The fact that state sovereignty is challenged by private and supranational actors from multinationals to NGOs is by no means new and is widely accepted since the 70s. Yet the internet makes the phenomenon more glaring by its nature. Uh, the internet ignores borders and with them jurisdictions. Who exactly are for instance, the people that ought to be setting, or at least electing those that then get to set, the rules of the internet. If a South African Instagram user posts content that is then viewed in Sweden, which jurisdiction's rules should apply to their post? The laws of the country of the poster, the viewer, or of the HQ of the platform hosting the content? As you can see, well, content moderation is a lawyer's nightmare. And the core of the conundrum is clear. As the internet has moved our economies, the democratic fora of participation and our ways of interacting with one another, our ecosystems of soft and hard regulation have not kept up the pace. Taxation is an obvious example. Before the recent OCD agreement, the bulk of principles defining international taxation dated back to the early 20th century, back when there was no free movement of capital and no standardization of accounting, let alone the World Wide Web, social media, productive algorithms, and AI. And as a growingly significant part of the economy moved to models of intangible global value chains, our ways of allocated tax bases were still conceived in an idea of labor intensive, plant-based production. Our legal systems were playing catch up. And it is exactly the same for data governance, AI privacy. They reflect a similar paradigm, an outdated, obsolete framework based on assumptions that do not hold anymore. The need for a global agreement makes filling that gap, that policy gap, far harder and more complex than any other policy gap. The recent OCD deal struck, in fact, shows that it is theoretically at least possible to envisage and implement international post-sovereignist frameworks that put a stop to social dumping, suboptimal races to the bottom. But such a measure really has only been possible via immense pressure exerted by policymakers of all the geopolitically influent global North countries, France, the UK, Italy, Germany, eventually, and most importantly, really, the United States. It appears that when political capital votes and more importantly, really, tax revenue are on the line, the shaping powers of the world are willing to bang their fists on the negotiating table. What is more important is whether such achievements of international negotiation and consensus 
building can be replicated for matters such as content moderation, privacy, data governance. And that is a whole other story. Firstly, out of pure variability in, of opinions and position standards and what should and should not be allowed in the media differ wildly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The degree of compromise, for instance, on data protection versus business friendliness that policymakers around the world are willing to accept varies massively. Secondly, because the narrative is nowhere near as clear as with taxation. The scenario isn't as straightforward and easy to understand as multinationals wanting to avoid taxation. Some small countries willing to let them as long as they benefit and bigger countries fighting to the nail to avoid this from happening. Data protection, censorship on social media and location of cloud servers are all topics that touch on profoundly more sensitive matters. Sovereignty or approach to democracy, strategic autonomy, and the resistance governments have to delegate to supranational instances decisions on these fronts is well deeply rooted. But as complicated as it might be, though, what we must agree on is that the current status quo is unacceptable, suboptimal, an absence of international guidelines and established fora, and frankly, up to harmonization can only default to big tech setting the rules and government trying to catch up with an enforceable late wildly divergent regulations. Let's let me just provide a clear example that dominated debate. Trump's ban from Twitter. Uh, no matter where your opinion stands on this matter, it should not be up to a handful of executives in a boardroom in a skyscraper in Manhattan to decide what political candidates and officials get to say. It should be up to courts following the rules set by legislators, elected and publicly accountable officials, that is. Oversight boards can at best be a complementary tool, a useful one but not the bedrock of our judicial system of content moderation. Social media platforms are now more than ever, more than a simple service consumers subscribe to by implicitly agreeing to the terms of usage. Who even reads them anyway? They've become a vector of information. The main arena of modern democratic debate is via their Facebook and Twitter feeds that people form their political opinions or swayed on their consumption habits, organize their activism. And as such, they need rules to govern them, to give them a clear field of applicability, to identify accountable figures that can answer to the implementation of these rules. Just like journalism spatial status, as it started becoming more and more important uh, between the 19th and 20th century, it was enshrined, that role was enshrined in a legal framework. Its responsibility as a prerequisite for circulation of information was recognized by constitution special laws. It comes with powers and with duties and the power of big tech, and social media more specifically, it can be argued, goes far beyond that of newspapers back then. And well, our legal frameworks must reflect that. Finally, and please let me finish, I've spoken for far too long. The setting of those rules must not be obtuse and should not be at the mercy of political whim. From politicians across the world, we ought to demand the courage to set aside power plays and show willingness to drive forward the conversation without falling into the Oh, so tempting temptation of weaponizing the topical matters for political gain. From organizations that make up the multiform environment that is the internet, we must expect understanding of the huge social responsibility that sector entails. And more importantly, a retreat in the raging conviction that the internet should only answer to its CEO's conscience. So figuration from, should move on from being the only game in town to a complementary tool. Finally, from civil society and consumers, we must ask to engage constructively in the process, to spark debates, to fuel understanding, to encourage compromise. Easier said than done, some might say, but crucial, most should say. Um, what an incredibly rich set of provocations, uh, and thank you for sharing them with us, Nicola. I'm sure that the audience, much like myself, is inclined to revisit the imbalanced and oft exclusionary archive of democracy building and to think about its manifestation in our present. Not only are the analogies you offer important lessons to learn from, they are also a jolting reminder of the propensity of the past to repeat in the future, unless you begin to think about solutions that sharply depart from the status quo and endeavor towards change. And no statement, I think, uh, captures this, this need for discourse on these solutions more succinctly than the one you conclude your response on, Nicola. Yes, it's easier said than done, but crucial. Um, at the heart of the statement is the quest Siddhant teased out from your response, that of interrogating the status quo. Closely aligned then with this interrogation of who the term people encompasses is our next question. 
Raghu, our question is to you. And the question is, is internet governance characterized by a divide between the global North and the global South? And if so, how do these disparities manifest in regulatory frameworks? As we begin to think about the future uh, of internet governance, should stakeholders be urged towards a top-down approach, a bottoms-up one, or a curious mix of both, and why so? Oh, thank you for your question, Sanskriti. And I believe it critically highlights the North-South analytical framework, which is and has been central to a host of world issues. To consider it in context of global internet governance, let's look at things from the very start. Never before have our lives been more interconnected. We're constantly surrounded by digital and internet-based technologies, which are constantly creating, storing, and sharing personal data and information. And this has only become more pronounced with the onset of the pandemic. As would already be clear, global digital governance refers to rules, norms, policies, standards, and institutions that collectively coordinate and shape the global cyberspace. Needless to say, the governance of the digital realm has long-term commercial, political, social, and socio-technical implications. And then it is not really altogether surprising to find a tussle raging between actors across the spectrum with each side attempting to impose its vision and reflect its worldview on the digital economy. The discourse on global internet governance and the North-South divide, North -South divide is not really new per se and is mere extension in some ways to the development since the 1960s. You have this period of Cold War where there was massive information and communication divide between the North and the South, which largely emanated from North's monopolization of the information order, which included everything from news agencies to telephones. And with these asymmetric information flows between these factions came a lot of well-documented concerns which were voiced by the developing world, such as about the imbalance of information flows itself, the general disrespect for developing world's culture, the hegemony of transnational corporations, and the inequitable distribution of resources, and so on and so forth. But also to characterize this matter in these binary terms would also be folly, since the period was marred with various other issues of development, of democratization, decolonization, demonopolization, and matters of sovereignty for the newly emergent independent nations of the South. Fast forward a few decades and the conflict over information order has not only not been resolved, but in the context of astonishing advances in the area of ICT has resurfaced through World Summit on Information Society and the North-South divide over global internet governance. In today's world, the digital gap has emerged as one of the most visible aspects of the developmental divide, both within and across nations. To give you an example of this, consider India. While the spread of information about the virus was almost as viral, was very viral uh, amongst the urban digitally connected India, there was palpable lack of awareness about it in the rural areas, where many initially dismissed the symptoms as merely just a seasonal flu. And to talk about the divide in global context, you have nations in Western Europe who are thriving in this digital age, while those in Africa and other parts of the world, which are still struggling with issues as basic as the internet connectivity. The industrialized nation's dominance of the internet, both in terms of the technical resources and the broader public policy, has only added a new dimension to the North-South North divide. And the present multi-stakeholder framework of global internet governance also fails here. And even though it was envisioned as a platform to bring stakeholders across the spectrum on a level playing field through structural problems and their power imbalances, the multi-stakeholder model has ended up prioritizing the private and commercial interests and inevitably, what it does is marginalizes the concerns of the South. As a result, you have global internet governance, which has become a complicated, multifaceted, and an urgent issue between the North and the South, with major consequences, not only for just a equitable internet governance, but also for a global economic system. I think also at this stage, it's very interesting to uh, look at the manner in which these disparities and conflicts manifest in regulatory structures. And it is not just interesting because uh, the already fuzzy line we just spoke about, uh, spoke about tends to get even more bloody around this area. What we're, with, what, we're, what we're witnessing right now is a dramatic shift in global norms towards greater state intervention in our digital lives. The recent annual report by Freedom House notes that because of a push towards censorship and surveillance, there's a global decline in internet freedom for the 11th consecutive year. And again, that is not to say that all forms of state intervention have been carried out in bad faith, no. That is far from what I'm saying. But many measures and many measure, many of these, many of these measures and initiatives have been carried out in good faith, which represent legitimate efforts on the part of the government to rein in online harm, prevent misuse of data, and so on and so forth. But also something that needs to be acknowledged at the same time is that many states have also passed various proposals and enactments to censor problematic content, compel platforms to break encryption, 
or to force them to share data with the authorities. And you have numerous examples of states giving into the notion of cyber sovereignty under the garb of preserving and protecting national interests. And these instances are not just limited to countries which we immediately associate with regressive and repressive activities. In fact, many of the developed liberal nations are also indulging in suppression of speech at home and abroad. What is evident from all this is that it is setting a dangerous precedent across the world, and particularly among the developing nations, and can have long-term political, economic, and cultural ramifications. And this in turn will compromise the internet's free, open, and interoperable character, which we've known and which has become the very bedrock on which the, on which the digital economy thrives. And sure, we have had some positive developments too, such as EU's GDPR regime. Although it too has been criticized for stifling innovation and having limited adaptability outside of Europe. So we have a very precarious situation where the developing countries with the growing middle class are under pressure to embrace policies that promote science and tech driven innovation as a means of boosting economic growth. And parallelly, they're also faced with the choice of whether to wield their power for advancing the state agenda or to take a different approach altogether which is in line with the international standards, international human rights standards, one which necessitates extensive use of state resources at the expense of often fledgling private sector. With the multi-stakeholder model losing support and many states increasingly hesitant to adopt a limited role in framing the future course of global internet governance, it's really not hard to imagine that the authoritarian alternative seems more appealing. However, that road inevitably leads to curtailment of individual rights and thwarts internet innovation. And even if you take example of some states like India or Singapore who establish policy combinations, their own policy combinations, the possibility of splinternet grows increasingly. Ultimately, what we can definitively say at this juncture is that although unique in its structure and the challenges it poses, global internet governance is yet another avenue which is marred with complex issues and well, no broad consensus on resolving them. But at the same time, what we need to acknowledge is that it is critical that developing nations and stakeholders across the spectrum engage equitably in global internet governance. And this is, not, this is crucial not just to uphold the fundamental principles of political participation, democracy, and human rights, but also ensure development and security of the world at large. How effortlessly you bring into conversation the varied frameworks without, without reproducing sort of binaries, Raghu. Thank you for that. Uh, notably, you, and much like the speakers before, make the conversation much more realistic and nuanced, which balances the challenges and complications of this ecosystem with the promises and potential it holds. And I think, Sid, your articulation of this facet of Raghu's response showcases just how we can contemplate the multiple interests and voices populating the space as lending themselves to political, social, economic, and overall systemic manifestations, which may be at contest with each other, but are not devoid of hope for harmonization and agreement. And I guess it is this insight which helps us segue into our next set of questions, which are targeted towards thinking about how we can draw on extant practices and scholarship to map our collective digital futures together. And so our question to Hiba arises out of this, this, this quest, this endeavor. Um, and Hiba, so the question for you is, what are some of the promising precedents, case studies, and mechanisms to consider as we attempt to shape the future of digital governance? Are there often spoke of mistakes that we can learn from as well? Thank you, Sansriti. We can all agree that there is transformational power in how the digital space has taken over various aspects of modern society. From economic and financial to political and social, digital platforms have far-reaching impacts. It would be wrong to state that the internet is perhaps the most key developments of our time. The irony is, despite it being so deeply integrated in our lives, very few actually understand the complexity of how it works. What we need to understand is that the internet is not a monolithic technological tool, but rather an accumulation of systems, protocols, and organizations that come together to make this virtual space. Similarly, there are many other aspects of internet governance, all equally complex, that require intricate engineering and institutional coordination across governmental and private bodies. To put the concept of internet governance simply as stated by UNWGI Jean, it is a development and application by governments, private sector, and civil society of shared procedures that shape the utilization of the internet. For long, internet governance bodies like the IAB, ICANN, IETF have modeled open, transparent internet standards. 
the idea goes that openness of governance begets openness of technology. An idea that resonates closely with a multi-stakeholder governance model that believes in a free and open internet concept. Quoting Barlow's declaration of the independence of cyberspace, it rejects the idea of cyberspace needing real world institutions and remedies and supports the original ideology of the internet being free to free people. Whereas the intergovernmental control model takes a more reserved approach and prefers a centralized body of governance. We see how cyberspace sovereignty infiltrates this model as here the state controls the internet within its border. There's been much conversation surrounding the fragmentation of the internet, whether liberal democracies with their user-friendly policies are able to give justice to the non-fragmented model, and whether authoritarian regimes with their comparatively enhanced information control metrics and state-dominant narrative fall into the fragmented models remains a debate yet to be resolved. As the world enters a phase of increased censorship in the name of national security, we need to question ourselves as to where the concept of human rights in the digital space stand. As identified by Net Mandal, rights in a virtual setting should be like the ones implemented in the physical space. Thus, human rights law, which encompasses freedom of expression, privacy, and accessibility to information become a vital component to be integrated into the governance framework. This is something the Freedom of Expression Initiative until Article 19 tackles. As social media companies' content moderation practices have great influence over freedom of expression and human rights, it is worthy to appreciate initiatives like Article 19 Social Media Councils and the Oversight Board, uh, Board in moderating online content. We've all seen how COVID-19 pandemic accelerated digital transformation across various channels. We see how emerging technology like IoT and AI are practically changing the digital sphere. As emerging technologies shape modern society, we must take an interdisciplinary approach in identifying an ethical governance methodology for these platforms, all the while tackling issues surrounding trust, security, and privacy on these platforms. The governance of emerging technologies at the Oxford Internet Institute investigates how to design, deploy, and govern emerging technologies. Digging deeper, cybersecurity becomes an important aspect as these technologies have accelerated data sharing, cloud storage, and easy access, thus creating a more vulnerable cyberspace. So what direction is the fate of the internet headed? Let us look at some key policies to help answer this. The EU is a clear supporter of an unfragmented internet model. With the initiative Europe's Digital Divide, EU aims to promote the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. By introducing policies like the DSA, DMA, as well as the cybersecurity strategy for the digital decade, it is evident that EU wants to be a norm maker in the internet's affair. Similarly, Taiwan is another great example. Maintaining a democratic approach to governance, it hosts one of the most freest online environments in Asia. China introduced a global data security initiative that is a more fragmented approach as it does not mention human rights or freedom of expression. While India tries to promote the idea of digital sovereignty in cyberspace, it is also trying to be more future oriented and integrate policies that strike a balance between gated globalization and libertarian paternalism. UK's recent online safety bill is changing the game for social media. However, such initiatives have received vast criticism for having the pot potential to inhibit freedom of expression and enhance censorship at the hands of the government. At this point in time, where there's so many conflicting governance models in place, it is tough to state which is better or worse. As the global internet freedom declines for an 11th consecutive year and global norms shift towards dramatic, um, towards government in intervention in the digital sphere, we do keep all factors in mind. It is imperative to take a global approach to governance and identify a unified front that balances governmental control, all the while ensuring the essence of what the internet was created for, the freedom to be and let be is well in place. Thanks, Seba, for helping us identify some lessons we could probably learn from as we move towards charting a just digital ecosystem. Indeed, techno-nationalism is on the rise. And we're seeing manifestations across this, across jurisdictions in different forms of intensity, so to speak. To me, I think your point about the EU wanting to be a norm maker in digital policy making is also very interesting. And it shows this unspoken race that has started globally to create regulation. One that we've seen multiple examples of in history at various other sites of governance. Um, and in this race, governments must be cognizant of the many trade-offs that pervade this arena. 
Borrowing Gretel and Weber's terminology, balancing these wicked problems will be one of the most significant challenges for digital policy making in the future. With this in mind, we raise our question to Saishreya. How can the innumerable dichotomies and trade-offs that pervade the core of digital governance be reconciled as we move towards our collective digital futures? Well, in the sphere of digital governance, there are an endless number of trade-offs to consider. But how are trade-offs defined in this case? Essentially, they signify how two or more opposing factors are evaluated in order to make a decision. For instance, the most familiar trade-offs in this sphere exist in the friction between individual rights, say privacy, anonymity, and agency, and collective rights, like security, efficiency, and innovation. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, the most blatant trade-off is obviously the one between privacy and public health. Now, clearly, these indicate three factors primarily influencing trade-offs, the number and nature of stakeholders, situation or circumstances in specific, and the outcome based on its objectives and how it's measured. But to start off, let's look at the trade-off between privacy and national security. Post 9-11 and in light of the war on terror, the implications of national security have changed considerably, especially using military and digital infrastructure. At the national level, countries have revolutionized rhetoric to justify what is done in the name of national security. For instance, the government of India legitimized the imminence of the ban on TikTok and over 100 other apps in the country's interests of national security. But what raises an eyebrow in India's case are two things. Firstly, India's domestic data protection law remains to be notified in parliament after over three years of discussion. And secondly, the entire efficacy of bans as a way of protecting Indian interests of data is questionable because of the lack of a proper legislative framework thus far, makes it possible to violate data protection through a foreign or an Indian company. Basically, neither is privacy adequately protected and nor is national security. Now, another interesting case study is China's latest privacy law, the PIPL. In China's case, what's conspicuous is that even with all the emphasis on protecting citizens' data and preventing misuse from private players, the same responsibility or liability does not extend to the state in any way. Now, both these cases are crucial to consider vis-a-vis -vis the existence of huge digital governance regimes with all supposedly ideal intents and purposes, but lack a more clear or rigorous foundation for digital constitutions. Now, that raises two questions crucial for all stakeholders to consider and address for our digital future. Firstly, can states be held liable for their own surveillance, like through the use of drones or state action like cyber attacks? If so, to what extent can they be upheld and guaranteed? Now, secondly, should domestic and international law redefine what constitutes use of force in the digital world? And if so, what frameworks would be helpful domestically? Now, having raised these questions, let's look more closely at the clash between individual and collective rights from a different paradigm entirely. Our project's digital policy tracker covered Chile's landmark legislation in its new ontology and legislative establishment of neuro rights so as to safeguard our mental privacy, personal identity, free will, and fair access to mental augmentation. This gives us insights into the possibilities of asserting and protecting ourselves against misuse of malpractice. Now, Shoshona Zuboff, in her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, mentions how platforms have introduced an era of surveillance capitalism, a concept wherein it's not simply the user's right to privacy that is violated, but even especially the right to autonomy and agency. Now, certainly users wouldn't want to agree to such a contract. Well, some of these platforms have become essential to everyday life in such a way that individuals are coerced, the incentives are aligned to an affirmative decision, and only drawbacks exist for indecision or lack of one. While this may be, still be legal, it's not so transparent. Moreover, there exists no real alternatives to these services, and most people aren't really aware of the extent of its operations. Now, how can we reclaim our agency and regulate while also retaining the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit? Well, there are three approaches that are crucial here. Firstly, the most crucial reaction would be to enhance stakeholder conversations such that parties have the requisite information aimed at more human-centered design. Plus, any government or other stakeholder intervention requires adequate checks and balances, like, for instance, limiting state surveillance to necessity and proportionality. 
The second approach requires reviewing antitrust and competition laws, obviously. So I said it's focused on avoiding surveillance capitalism altogether as a form of revenue. Now, the third, third and final approach is bridging the informational divide between the entity and the individual, which is pivotal for a digital and democratic society. Thank you, Saishraya, for highlighting these fascinating dichotomies and challenges prevalent in this domain. Your response raises many further questions of how we can harmonize policy making for the internet as a global and local common. And because we're also running out of time, perhaps this is a perfect question to end the panel on. And our question to you, Harshvi, is can digital policy making worldwide adhere to certain values, standards, best practices, and thresholds? And if so, how? Thank you for your question, Sanskriti. Um, I think we can all agree that positive or negative, datafication has consequences for the well-being and the uh, cohesion of our society as a whole. Governments and regulators play a major role in incentivizing digital innovation for the benefits of our society. They can foster public interest and limit unintended negative consequences of these developments by providing norms that reflect societal values and preferences. For instance, through the Global Data Protection Framework, governments aim to design data privacy standards for intermediaries who process, store, and share data. The policy's vision is to give informed authority to the owners and the creators of data through a secure and easy-to-use platform. However, despite efforts being made to accelerate institutional digitization globally, technological advancement continues to outpace policy evolution. Contemporary regulatory mechanisms often lack the agility to accommodate the increasing pace of technological developments. They challenge the way government regulates. Digital technologies tend to develop faster than the regulations and the social structures that govern them, making it difficult to design a fit-for-purpose regulatory framework. Digitalization also blurs the lines between markets and sectors, consumers and producers, and sometimes even nations. This questions the traditional notion of liability, making it more and more difficult to attribute responsibility for harms caused by the use of technology. For instance, with the internet offering new ways to distribute content, it is becoming more and more difficult to enforce copyrights. The traditional institutional framework was made of ministries and agencies that dealt with sector-based challenges. But with the transversal challenges created by digitalization, this framework is facing its limits. Digitalization has essentially transcended administrative boundaries, both domestically and internationally, and has increased the intensity of multilateral risks that undermine the effectiveness of action. This leads to a decline in the people's trust in government, which in turn creates barriers for potentially beneficial digital innovations. The right way, however, to deal with this fast pace of digitalization is not rushing into regulation. It might seem like the best way out to develop policies as quickly as the digital space transforms, but in doing so, there is a real risk of getting it wrong. In some cases, a regulatory approach may not even be the best course of action. Traditional policy tools provide us with crucial opportunities to pause, consult, question, and test various approaches to determine the frameworks that best help promote digital innovation while mitigating the risks. Such innovations can include short-term solutions, like explicitly preventing the development and use of certain technologies, adopting a wait-and-see approach to understand which perceived risk actually materializes, or by creating regulatory sandboxes where new technologies can be tested in safe spaces without immediately incurring any regulatory consequences. Given the dynamics of digital transformation, the chosen regulatory solutions will require periodic adaptations and constant government monitoring. Thus, adopting long-term solutions that take a whole of government approach that relies on coherence among government bodies and stakeholders is needed to mitigate the current and prospective risks of digitalization. Governments need to actively engage in a diverse or with a diverse range of stakeholders, invest in foresight and horizon scanning, initiate impact assessments early in the policymaking process, and carry out post-implementation reviews. Like I mentioned earlier, the effects of digital transformation span across borders, which mean that solutions restricted to domestic domain will no longer suffice. International regulatory cooperation is needed to address these challenges. However, such cooperation is challenging because of different priorities and different governing systems between nations. A well-governed digital policy that adheres to universal thresholds has to be one that satisfied, much satisfies multiple stakeholders while remaining rigid enough to ensure strategic efficiency. Initiatives such as the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, the Global Network Initiative, or the Santa Clara Principles have facilitated dialogue between intermediaries 
such as internet access providers, tech companies, academic experts, and civil society. Such practices, however, are sparse as most countries rely on traditional approaches that prioritize compliance and risk mitigation. Thus, when it comes to internet governance, regulators need to rethink their approach in a way that prioritizes active enablement over control. It is both timely and crucial to engage in such discussions, given that the process of digital transformation is challenging our current regulations and creating new regulatory needs as we speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harshvi, for helping us identify these emerging good practices global digital governance can probably take note from. Because we are out of time, we'd just like to thank you all for joining in today. And uh, as Hiba has posted in the chat box, please do engage with us through our email, our social media handles, and through the feedback form that IGF has. And we look forward to a continued conversation. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.